All right, good morning. Try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right, you're awake. Welcome to Woodland Community Church this morning. So glad that you're here. Glad to be back with you. And uh, sort of uh, resume activities again as uh, quote unquote normal. Uh, the youth group has started and is going, and uh, that's every Sunday night for the high schoolers, every Wednesday night for the middle schoolers, and that is 6:20 to 8:20. And uh, we happen to have some teenage boys in the house, and we know that every hour is mealtime. They're always hungry, no matter what. So the snack sign-up is open for the youth group, and what a, what a great way to minister to those kids. There's a sheet in the back at the kiosk if you're here at church, or if you're not, you could contact uh, Pastor Michael, I'm sure, and, and sign up for a date to provide snacks for those kiddos. Uh, the, speaking of snacks, the ladies' shopping trip is also uh, has entered the sign-up phase, and that's uh, November 14th. They head to Eau Claire on a bus. $15 gets you a really comfy bus ride, some great fellowship with people, some coffee and rolls in the morning, and then a chance to do some shopping in Eau Claire. So uh, that sign-up has started, and there's some information again at the kiosk or, or some, uh, you can contact Linda Borkhardt, I believe, or uh, I think Java Journey and Man Made. Uh, are places you could sign up as well. Uh, another thing that's going to be starting uh, soon, soonish, True Seekers will be back on November 4th, all right, for our younger kids. And there's information coming this week in your church email or on Facebook with the details about how it will look this year. And if you're a leader for that, that training will be the 28th. The week before, we'll do a leader training, and then we'll kick off on Wednesday, November 4th. And again, look for details in your emails. Do you get a lot of emails these days? We're doing a lot in Google Classroom, and I have it set up so that I get emailed every time a kid turns something in. <clears throat> My inbox is quite large, uh, and, and emails can be a, a quite a, a lost sea of places. So just a reminder that our church is sending out emails about different updates or things going on, and, and be, be aware of that and look for that uh, as we try to communicate with you uh, from the church in that, in that way. So, all right, well... That's the announcements. Again, thank you for being here, and let's uh, worship together. Encouraging to see uh, a number of people here, and I invite you to uh, stand and uh, worship the Lord with me as we sing. Come, let us worship and bow down. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His Good morning, Woodland. Good morning. It's great to see all of you here in the sanctuary, and welcome to those who are joining us over the stream. Uh, this morning, we're opening our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, and um, the main passage is about keeping our minds focused on heaven. And, uh, and so this brought me to a psalm, Psalm 73, where 
uh, the beginning of the psalm, it's kind of long, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the beginning of the psalm is uh, David really kind of complaining to the Lord, saying, Lord, why are the evil prospering and doing so well? They're going to dead fat and, and not bruised, and, and the evil are just prospering in this life, and so he's got complaints. Um, but then there's a change in his attitude, and it happens when he goes and worships the Lord in, his, in the Lord's sanctuary. It's in the sanctuary where David begins to think heavenwardly, and that completely changes his attitude. Let me read the last few verses of Psalm 23 um, when David starts to put his mind on heaven. Verse 23 says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of your works. What a comfort that is, that when we start to put our minds and our hearts on heaven, it's no longer about the struggles, about the things that don't make sense to us and things that we might get frustrated about in this life. It's about our portion and our strength in heaven, and that changes everything, the, every day that, that we face in this life. And so, um, and it changed how we talk. He ends by saying, I have set, uh, or I may tell of your works. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to tell others, we're going to tell one another about the works that God has done in our lives. Um, and so as we do, we're going to bring others in, up to our, in, in prayer with us. So uh, our missionary emphasis is the Polis family at Harvest Homes, and they've got praises that they'd like to share with us about the way that God's been working. They want to share with us that uh, they have been donated, donated a fire, a wood fire um, pizza oven, and so they've been using that to serve many different groups, including 24 members of their local sheriff's department. And so they've been praising the Lord by, with that gift and the ministry being done with that. Um, they continue to praise God for how he continues to uh, provide funding for um, their, their ministry and for the many guests who continue to come on the weekends and just uh, uh, stay in their guest house. Uh, they do have some prayer requests. Becky is, um, is uh, now full-time at uh, the school as the school nurse, so pray for her. Uh, for the planning and preparation of the living nativity scene that they're going to, uh, community event that they're going to put up during Christmas, and uh, that they would continue to be a light. And so we're going to uh, raise up the, the Polis family and ministry of um, Harvest Home Farm this morning, but we're also going to keep in mind those in our own midst here in, in Westboro, in Rib Lake, who are, are maybe dealing with illness, a couple new folks that we can be praying for, our, our Sue Tombs and um, Pat Huber. Uh, they, they're, they're not feeling well this week, so let's keep them in our prayers. And also those who are still making their way, way back from, from fighting the virus here. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we have an inheritance waiting for us in heaven, Lord, that our citizenship is in heaven, that, Lord, we are just sojourners in this, this difficult and kind of uh, dark and depressing life that it can be at times, but, Lord, it's so beautiful because you are with us. You, um, you have sent your Son, and, and we have forgiveness of sins and, and are now considered citizens of heaven. So, Lord, help us to keep our minds and our hearts engaged and focused in on you, Lord, that uh, we would just forsake what's behind us and press forward to the calling that is before us. Um, and in, in so doing, Lord, would you work in our lives to, to reveal your glory to us and through us, Lord. And so, Lord, we would just want to praise you for the ways that you're working um, in our lives. We want to praise you for the way that you are meeting the Polis ministry, Lord, down in Harvest Homes. Um, Harvest Fr um, Farm, sorry. Um, just the way that you are providing for their needs down there, that you're giving them creativity and serving uh, the people around them and, and, and uh, ministering to them, Lord. We want to continue to pray for their needs. Um, 
and ask that you would continue to show your faithfulness to that ministry, guide them um, during these uh, odd times that we're living in, and, and help them to glorify you, Lord. We think of Sue Toombs, and we think of Pat Huber, and just ask that you'd uh, give them strength and encouragement as they struggle with illness, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for all the many Woodland um, people that have made it through uh, the virus and are, and are recovered and, and um, coming back and, and able to join us, Lord. Uh, we continue to pray that uh, you would help us to regather, that we would be a people uh, that are, are worshiping you in, 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 in love and in truth and spirit, Lord, that uh, we would continue to gaze upon you and make you our, our rock and our strength. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, yeah, our passage being from Philippians 3 and about pressing on and uh, toward the goal. And some of you know that I do a few cross-country ski races, and uh, Norm Hoyt does too. And, and I'm, I'm not in that class of skiers where I'm actually going to win anything, but especially if there's thousands of skiers, but even if there's only like 100. Um, and maybe my goal is more, and there's still a little bit of that competitive fire in me that maybe I can finish in the top certain number in my age group, which when you get in your 60s, is a little is easier than when you're in your 50s. Um, but anyways, uh, sometimes it gets really hard, and the snow is bad, or it's too warm, believe it or not, or something like that, and it gets really hard, and you just want to finish. But at least you want to finish strong. And uh, not just to look good, but just, I want to finish strong. And uh, anyway, so you press on, and you do the best you can. So I invite you to stand and sing. We've got a couple songs that have something to do with pressing on. Oh 
beautiful. One more song. Um, this, uh, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, some of you will remember the, like the early 90s, and uh, our son, our oldest son, Tom, uh, I think my brother gave him a boom box, and he had some cassette tapes, including one from Petra. That was pretty edgy, <laughs> but if you look, if you think about the songs that were on that tape, they're classics. And anyways, this is one of them. Uh, the battle belongs to the Lord. did not sound like Petra. <laughs> I went to that concert. <laughs> uh, hey, good morning, church family. Good morning, all you out there. You are here. Good morning to you. Well, at the beginning, I guess, of the new week, I'm thankful for all the ways that we get to gather. I'm thankful for the great number of us who are making it through quarantines and through illness. And We have some of you out there, and we remember you, uh, those of you who are still sick. Um, but I'm thankful that we're where we are and the opportunity to gather like this and in other ways throughout the week just reminds me of how precious gathering is and how valuable people are. Amen. At different times, I've been able to just sit and talk to people and realize that, you know, a year ago this would have been a conversation. Yeah, have a nice week, have a nice day, see you soon, you know. And now I realize, wow, this is a human person that I'm talking. This is in person. There's something so very special that goes on when we actually sit and take time and spend time with each other. And that's, that's, my, that's my thought for the week. And I, I, 
I hope that you can join me in that. Have you ever felt like your best years are behind you? I like that, Scott, the, but the, the ski racing. Did you know that in last year's Hinder Binder, I won my age group? <laughs> I won. Norm, I won. Now, there were no other entries. <laughs> I was first and last. And my goal next time is to shave an hour off my time. <laughs> I am from Texas, after all. I like the word, though, about the 50s being so competitive. Because that means that as I've tripped like the wire, my best days are maybe ahead of me. Can they be? Yeah. At least in skiing, Norm. Best days behind you. You know, when, when we're young, trailhead, you know, life just, where are you? You're all over the place. Life feels like a video game, right? You, you kind of figure the game out and you keep going to the next level. And you're never going to get knocked off because you figured the game out and you're just moving up and up and up and up. Maybe not for everybody, but that, that's the way it tends to be. Um, but when we get on a little bit, it's kind of like we can start seeing the end. It comes into focus. We're like, okay, I keep doing what I'm doing now. Add 20 years. Oh, I can kind of see how, how this works. And you know what? It can be a little bit discouraging as we contemplate the good stuff that's behind us and think about, wow, maybe some of that stuff I won't get to do in life, and maybe we're even a little bit embarrassed that we ever thought we were going to do all that great stuff because now we have a modest or more modest self-estimate of, of who we are. This passage is for anybody who's ever had that thought that our best years are behind us because this passage teaches us that it is not true. That, that the great glory of life found in Jesus is actually ahead of us. We're in Philippians 3. We're going to start in verse 12. We're doing just four verses today. Uh, this passage is an extension of the early part of the chapter, chapter 3, 1 to 11. Um, you know, if we, if we had unlimited time up here, we would teach like, the chunks that belong together, but sometimes we have to divide things. Last week, we, we talked about how joy comes from knowing Jesus. And as we, we meet Jesus in this life and we trust him, there is loss, which includes all those things that we've counted on in life up to this point, and we now realize that those things, so many of them being good, we hope, uh, are still good, but they are nothing compared to Jesus. For Paul, it was uh, works of the law, which would have involved excelling as a Pharisee and as a law keeper and as a religious person and as being a person that people emulated. He says, that's all loss. I count this all as rubbish in order to gain Christ in order to know Jesus because Jesus plus no nothing equals everything. So last week is all about loss and about gain. We ask the question every week, where does joy come from? This week, joy comes from pressing on toward Jesus. That's what we're excited about as we go through life with Jesus. Uh, I'd like to read, I'm gonna just drop in in the middle of last week's passage. And then I'm going to read all the way through verse 16. And then we're going to ask the Lord to help us understand this and kind of burn these words into our minds so that when we go through the next hard time, as though we aren't in a hard time because we are, we're going to remember them. And we're going to leave here more encouraged than, uh, than we were when we came in. So starting in verse 7. 
But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him, there's the idea, and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, whether I'm raised after having died, or whether I'm transformed, having not died, but living until Jesus comes back, that's what that means, by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And then our passage for this week. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own brothers I do not consider that I have made it my own but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus let those of us who are mature think this way And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Lord, these are profound words. These are words that we can't just read quickly and understand. And even if we can get a cognitive understanding of what they mean, uh, we are bodies and souls and you are shaping our souls and we need to take these words down into our inner beings and have your spirit work in us so that we are looking forward and pressing on toward Jesus and regardless of where we come from this week would you help us do that would you help us be people who are molded and shaped and mature as we press toward your son Jesus help us to to know these words and rightly apply them. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. These verses are about what it looks like to grow in faith. These verses are about what it looks like to gain maturity and to move toward Jesus in the business of life. Did you get the key expression here, the key word? It's press on. Press on. That is the main idea. We're going to press on because we belong to Jesus. We're going to press on like an athlete, and we're going to press on in maturity. Those are the three ideas that we pick up in these four verses. So as we read this, do you have a question in verse 12? You read verse 12. Here's the question. Maybe it's your question. I hope you ask this question. What is the it? What is the this? There's like five it's and five this's, this's in these these verses. What is it? Well, we, we know that it's what Paul hasn't attained, obtained yet. He knows Jesus. He has trusted in Jesus. He has a relationship with Jesus, but as he's pressing toward Jesus, which will happen after his resurrection or his transformation that Jesus is coming. There's a, there's a greater and fuller knowing of Jesus that he has not yet arrived at. And, and, and this goes back to verse 11. He recognizes that he, he'll, he'll either die and be raised with Jesus or he'll be alive when Jesus comes and then he'll be transformed. And He presses on to know Jesus in this complete sense, and it's all ahead of him. It motivates him, and it gives him purpose, and it gives him desire. Don't forget this guy is in jail. He he might be even on what we would consider death row. How many 
inmates do we have on death row who are so excited about what's coming next? Such a contrast, but that's where Paul is placing his hope. It's important to realize that these verses are not about salvation. They're they're, they're not really about trusting Jesus in that initial sense in which we, we hear the gospel and we trust Jesus and we are saved. Paul has been saved by grace through faith in Christ. This has already happened for Paul and now he's pressing on because he has already trusted Jesus. He belongs to Jesus. This is about what we would call sanctification or growth in holiness. Uh, Look at the wording of verse 12, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. It's not about becoming a Christian. It's about a Christian growing in maturity. And he recognizes that he's not yet conformed to the image of Christ. He's not yet perfect. And he needs to grow in holiness and he needs to be conformed to Jesus in his experience. Even Paul, even the great apostle, needed to grow. And to help us understand this, he gives us an illustration. He gives us some practical help to help us live the Christian life, and that's verses 13 and 14. So we're, we're to, to press on because you belong to Jesus, and then verses 13 and 14, press on like an athlete. You know, athletics were very important in ancient Greece. So Philippi in Macedonia, a province of ancient Greece. Uh, athletics, just like for us, You know, like, what are people really worried about during the pandemic? Are we going to get sports? Can these teams make it through and stay away from the rest of the population so they don't get sick so we can watch them? You know, and then we we get upset when they can't play. And, of course, now we have Tuesday night football. So I guess there's good things about this. There were famous festivals, athletic festivals in the ancient world. We know about the Olympics. That was still going on in the first century AD. There was also the Ithmian Games, which were actually in Corinth. So when, you re- when we read 1 Corinthians, there are so many passages about athletics, and it's possible that you know, the Ithmian Games were on TV, and Paul was watching those, and everybody was thinking about the Ithmian Games, and so that's why he had all those illustrations. There were also the, the Nemean Games. Never heard of those before, but I read it. I know it's true. And the Pythian game. So these were the four major festivals that, that rotated. I'm not sure quite how often, but they, they rotated in the first century. They were cultural festivals. They involved music and dancing and drinking and eating, kind of like our Olympics. They began with a torch relay which would have been like a team relay where different regions would compete in order to light what we would call the Olympic torch. We even see this when, when we do have the Olympics. So they would run, and then if they're first, they get to light the, the torch. There was boxing and wrestling and a strange sport called pancration, which was like a combination of boxing and wrestling where anything goes. There were no rules except... You can't poke eyeballs, and you can't do something else. But other other than that, anything goes in this sport. There was horse racing, chariot racing, javelin throwing, and then the oldest event, the, the original event of each of these festivals was a race called the Stadion, which, stadia, it involves a distance. It was 180 meters, and it was a very simple event. The, the runners could grab stones, and they could form like these blocks where they could sort of, like, you know, start blocks. They could form their own start blocks out of stones, and then they would run 180 meters, or maybe it was 90 meters. I think the whole thing was 180. They would run to a post, and they would go around the post and come back across the line. They would begin and end in the same place. Only here's the deal. You could trip people. 
You could grab people. You could bite people. You could tackle people. You could form coalitions and gang up on other people. Knock people down. So just because you make it to the post first doesn't mean that you're coming back to the start line. That must have been really something to watch. The victor would receive an award. Uh, The right to name his own city. That would be kind of fun. Brianville. (laughs) Brian Dorf. (laughs) Dorf Brian. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I would. I would. I would rename Westboro. (laughs) West Brian. I don't know. (laughs) They would also get a crown made out of celery leaf. That's no good. I wouldn't want that. They might get a cow. Depending on how important they were, they might get a certain volume of olive oil. Could be useful. Or they might get a pot. And though the pot doesn't sound exciting, that's mainly how we know about these events because we still have some of those urns, those pots. Here's an important factor that you need to know before you enter the race. You have to be a citizen. You can't be a slave. You can't be an outsider. You have to be a citizen. So we're we're talking about races that take place among the citizenry of the different Greek regions. I think that's actually important in this passage. The passage is not about how you earn your citizenship. You are a citizen of heaven when you trust in Jesus. And and, and now we're pressing forward toward Jesus himself. There are three words, three verbs, and they're phrases that are important in verses 13 and 14. And we can, we can drill down into these three verbs, and it helps us know how we are to run the race, how we're to press on, and, and what Christians do. The first verb is the verb forgetting. Interesting, huh? Forgetting what lies behind. This verb actually means paying no attention to. So as I think about and remember that, that so much of this goes on in the mind, all right, we see that go all, all through the book of Philippians, where he says, think like this. I need to be, and I struggled all week to find the right word here, select-minded. I need to be unencumbered-minded. I need to be not paying attention to what went on in the past, minded, find a better word and I'll buy you a coffee. It means I need to be disciplined in what I think about. You know, athletes are not ruminators, not the good ones anyway. Uh, Athletes make mistakes, they learn from them, but they move on quickly. I read once about a football player, I don't remember which one it was, but I think he was good. Um, later on, but when he was a kid, he was playing peewee or junior high football or something, and his dad, he was a quarterback. Did I say that? Yeah, he was a quarterback, and his dad bought him a wristband, and the deal was every time he made a mistake, he was supposed to take that wristband, pull it back, and snap it back on his wrist, and that was the indicator to him that that mistake is over. It's done. What fumble, what interception. That, it never happened. I'm only thinking about the next play. I'm only thinking about the next series. That's a good quarterback. That's a good athlete. And that is a maturing Christian who is pressing on toward Jesus. You know, we all come to Christ as sinners. And here's the deal about sinners. Sinners sin, right? Right? Sinners hurt people, sinners hurt themselves, sinners make messes of their lives. And when we come to Jesus, we come in faith. We accept the work of Jesus by faith, 
And remember what Jesus did. He took our sins on himself. All those things that we had yet to do, right? Jesus, even though it was in the future, he took those sins on himself. He paid the penalty for those sins. And so Jesus satisfies our account before God. Now, if God is satisfied with the work of Jesus, shouldn't I be? That's a profound thought. And so we're to be people who move forward, not to Christ's righteousness, but we move forward in Christ's righteousness. You know, a lot of us have trouble outliving our past. Especially in a small place where everybody knows us. They're like, oh yeah, you're the guy that. And that's how people think of us. How are you going to outlive that? You know what? The great news is we don't have to. We don't have to outlive our past. Somebody brings up who we used to be before we knew Christ. We just need to say, hey, let me tell you about what Jesus has done. And you know what? If we keep living and we keep pressing toward Jesus and we keep saying that to people, sooner or later they're going to start to believe us because they see us pressing forward toward Christ. That's the first verb, forgetting. We need help forgetting the past, and we need to be selective-minded, if that's the right word, about the past. Second verb, pressing on. No, that's the third verb. Second verb, straining. Straining forward to what lies ahead. Remember, think, athletic contests. Could be the running I don't know, it could be chariot racing. But think about it. You're balanced on, if you're racing chariot, I've never raced a chariot. It would be fun for a second. It'd be like bull riding, it would last six seconds if you're good. All right, you're standing on a little platform, you're straining forward, you're balancing. All right, or, or the running, reaching forward toward the goal. He's straining forward to what lies ahead. I need to be future-minded. I need to be future-minded as I'm pressing toward Jesus. This is not strictly about resurrection, I think. This is not just that Paul wants to be raised to newness of life and to live forever in a body that gets no viruses and isn't sick and won't die. It's not just that Paul wants to complete the course in holiness. He wants to be conformed to the character of Christ. He wants to know Jesus in this perfect and complete sense that we have when we are actually with a person. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, this similar idea in 1 Corinthians. He says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know, here's that word again, Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. 1 Corinthians 13. Gordon Fee, who was a a commentator of Philippians, he's a good one. He wrote 30 or 40 years ago. One of the reasons for our loss in hope in Western culture is that we are trying to make the present life eternal. Think about that. We're trying to take all that makes up existence and we're trying to live all that happiness right now. And, and, and one of the things that happens, and he wrote that 30 or 40 years ago, but one of the things that happens is that we are extremely risk averse. If, if, if anything like a virus is an existential threat to us, if it will take you out of existence, then we should avoid that risk, and we should probably wear helmets when we walk out the front door too because there's a lot of risks out there, and you see it with our obsession with health. Um, you know, even, even in watching the Judge Barrett hearings this week, just the, the continual chatter about health and safety and fear and dread and so many of our leaders that even want higher office didn't even come to work because work is too dangerous can't turn up their fear and dread 
and a denial of the fact that we're all going to die. Maybe not a cognitive denial of that, but a, an existential. I don't want to think about that, that I might die somewhere. And we forget that the prize is entirely future. The prize is not in this life. And I need to ask myself, am I more motivated by things I can get now or by the prospect of being with Jesus? That's a real question that I need to ask myself as I go through this week. Pressing on, that's the third verb. Pressing on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call. I'm gonna screw that in a little bit, Jesse. I think it's actually come undone. It doesn't tighten down, it just spins. I just won't move. <laughs> Pressing on. That's the third verb. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I I need to be, I'm going to say, single-minded. Select, minded, future-minded, single-minded. Notice this is not an an issue dealing with perfection. It's about perseverance. You know, for Paul, the Christian life is all about calling. He's called to faith by the Spirit. He's called to be one of God's people. He's called to serve God by serving God's people. He's called to persevere through hardship. And he's called to be with Jesus in person. And the fact that the race is hard indicates that he's in the right race. It doesn't mean that he's in the wrong race. I think like that sometimes. It means I'm in the right race that I'm getting tripped up and somebody's biting me and these guys are ganging up on me. It's because I'm in the stadium and I'm racing for that, that finish line. Paul has Larry is coming to the rescue. Doesn't bother me. It probably bothers you, Larry. Is this all about things bothering you? All right. We're going to be on soon. Okay. Um, Paul has really strong things to say about people who don't finish the race. You know, he's like, run the race and you're going to get the prize. Uh, And there's not just one prize, but you finish the race and you get the prize. Over in 1 Corinthians again, 1 Corinthians 9, he says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, the celery wreath. But we an imperishable, thank goodness. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified for Paul to be disqualified is to is to fail to persevere and it's to demonstrate that he never trusted Christ in the first place right his prize is Jesus he says, I don't want to be the guy that made a lot a big show in my ministry and then flamed out and then melted away because Jesus wasn't my prize I want to arrive at Jesus So, Paul wants to be single-minded as he pursues Jesus. Final couple of verses. We're to press on in maturity. And this is really interesting to me because he doesn't describe us coming to the goal in this life. And there's never a point when we can say, oh, now I'm mature. I've made it to like level 3,000 or whatever. It's like, no, you're always growing until you're with Jesus. Let's just read those verses again because they get a little foggy in the memory. Verses 15 and 16. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. 
only let us hold true to what we have attained. I think Paul is taking a dig here at his opponents. Remember, these were guys that, say, that have said, we keep all these rules and we're good at it. We're mature. You're only preaching the gospel. You see, what you need to do is, okay, go ahead, trust Jesus, but then add all these rules on top of Jesus. And Paul says, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works. You never outlive the gospel. We who recognize that we're imperfect, but that are moving toward Jesus, that is what maturity looks like. The mature are those who know they aren't complete. The mature are those who aren't satisfied with their profession alone. They're not looking for the bare minimum in the Christian life. The mature are those who make progress, who are humble in their self-estimation of their progress because they're seeing Jesus. And then, then Paul simply entrusts the Philippians to God's care. If in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. In other words, I'm not here to micromanage your walk with God. I, I'm telling you what your hope is but you have the Spirit of God too. And he's going to work in your individual circumstances and in your hearts, and he's going to help you. I, I heard, heard a story once, and I really hope it's true because it makes a great point. It makes the great point even if it's not true. But it's a, a story about a young concert pianist who gave a concert in front of a packed auditorium, one of those great, concert halls with multiple you know decks in the back and he just played and played over an hour all from memory it was a wonderful concert and then when he finished he received a standing ovation and everybody clapped and clapped encore encore and he bowed humbly and then he walked out to the back and the the concert master came and found him oh uh, whatever his name was. They want an encore. And he said, no encore. No, 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 they're calling encore, encore. That was wonderful. Couldn't you just come out and play something more for us, just something short? And he said, no encore. And finally, the, the, the concert master in exasperation said, why won't you give the people an encore? And the young concert pianist said, well, because this one old man isn't standing. He's in the back, and he's not standing. Everyone else is standing. The old man is not standing. And the concert master said, oh, the old man, he doesn't know his music. And then the young pianist said, oh, but that old man is my teacher. And I'm only looking at him. He knows what this needs to look like. And his estimation is the only opinion that matters to me. We need to run we need to play, we need to compete figuratively, but then really and actually we need to live for an audience of one. And to be mature is to recognize that we're not there yet, but it's also to realize that our hope is in the, in the future. And then we get, these, we get this teaching here about how we're supposed to travel along the way, being select-minded, future-minded, and single-minded. Because joy comes from pressing on toward Jesus. You know, we are um, moving through our COVID year, year, aren't we? We had a COVID spring. That was fun. And we had a COVID summer. That was, eh. Now we're in COVID fall. And in order to complete the circuit, we'll probably go through a COVID winter. And I hope that goes all right. It's easy to despair. It's easy to think about uh, stuff like uh, large group gatherings, basketball games, concerts from memory, um, sitting in restaurants with... Uh, large groups of people laughing and eating 18 inches from other people. Um, Christmas parties, hanging around without masks. Um, as we think about these things, it's, it can be discouraging to think that for the time being, 
a lot of this stuff is in our memories. But when we read a passage like this, we realize this is not the year to check out. Right? This is the year, regardless of what's going on in society and the region and what the numbers say, this is the year to ramp up as we follow Jesus together, as we press on toward him, as we look for opportunities to gather with other people, no matter what that looks like. We need to gather often. We need to stay in God's word personally and together. And we need to remember that joy comes from pressing on toward Jesus. And let's pray and ask God to take these words down into our hearts because we need them. Father, help us as we read these few verses in your word to, to, to digest these words in our souls <laughs> and uh, be encouraged. Not be discouraged, not be in despair, not live in our memories. Uh, but to live in our sanctified imaginations as we think about how wonderful it will be to be with you, Jesus, and what joy we can have now as we press on toward you. And we need your help to do this um, because otherwise we become faint and we become frail and we think about not finishing the race, um, but we will by your grace. Help us as we do this. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes, My grace, or that God speaking here, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Um, let's sing together. His strength is perfect. Stand with me. Let's sing this through twice. So we're not done yet. We have at 1030 now education for children, youth, and adults. Stick around for that. We'll transform the uh, front of this room for kids, families. If you have an elementary age child or preschool age child, I guess, feel free to join us for that time. And uh, you know, we've been going through the different benedictions you might have noticed in the New Testament as we, uh, we do our send off time here. And uh, today I am thinking about um, Micah 6, 8, which is uh, an Old Testament benediction, or it can be. And this is what Micah 6, 8 said, says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And of course, Jesus then comes and shows us perfectly what that looks like. And we ask him to help us as we serve in the world, as we take individual circumstances and say, what does it look like to walk humbly before our God in this particular situation? Jesus then helps us through his spirit. 
So that's, a, that's our word, our send-off word for today. Have a great week in the Lord, those of you in person and those of you on the stream. And we will see you around town. Bless you. See you soon.